Well, welcome everyone and good morning. Happy March 1st. My name is Nicole Finnicum and I am the Assistant Director of Experiential Design for the College of Arts and Sciences uh, from the Center of Advising, Career and Experiential Learning. And I will be your moderator today for the session of bringing the whole school to the garden that will occur until about 10 a.m. today. So just a couple of housekeeping notes to get us started. Uh, please note that this session is being recorded and transcribed. Before we get started, I want to make um, just a couple more notes. Um, you will have access to your camera and your microphone today. We do ask that you keep both of those off during the presentation. However, there will be times during the session that do allow for some discussion. And during these times, you are welcome and encouraged to turn your microphone on as well as your camera so that you can participate. After these discussion times are over, and the speaker transitions back to his presentation, we ask that you then return your camera to off um, and as well as your mic until we begin the next discussion period. You will have access to the chat for the entire session. Feel free to put any comments or questions in the chat and the speaker will try to address them by the end of the session. If time does not allow for questions uh, to be addressed, the speaker will have access to the chat until after the, or until after the session has ended. <coughs> Um, so he'll be able to reach out to you directly. And now I'm excited to share a little bit more about our speaker today, Uli Kester. Uli is the director of the Midwest Food Connection, a Minnesota nonprofit that brings education on food, cooking, and gardening to children and families. Trained as an elementary teacher, Uli launched Midwest Food Connection in 1994. The organization now employs four teachers and works with over 50 schools each year. Uli especially loves leading students in multi-sensory adventures in the schoolyard garden. And without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Uli Kester. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole, for the nice introduction. Good morning, everyone. It's um, eight o'clock in Minnesota where I am, nine o'clock where you are. So it's, it's a bright sunny morning. We've got nice piles of snow outside. So we're not thinking about schoolyard gardens yet. Um, I think we'll go back to, the, I'm gonna have the PowerPoint come up. And we'll use some of those slides. So I want to welcome you. Our, the goal of what we're doing today, we'd like to have um, a brainstorming session, a thought session, get inspired about having children, young people in gardens. And especially I want to think about how to have large groups in the garden. There are often times when um, there are often times when people can get small groups in the garden, um, some schools, special ed schools, special teams, small classrooms, but it's often a challenge to have 25, 30 kids busy in the garden setting. So let's see, Nicole, I'm just going to check with you. Are we uh, waiting? I still see you in large. Are we waiting for the slides to come back or are they there? Um, I can see the slide right now. Okay. Participants should be able to. Okay, great. Okay. All right, we can go to the next slide, please. So that's my organization, the Midwest Food Connection. I'll tell a little bit more about that in a bit. We'll go to the next slide. So that's our primary goal for the day. So about, uh, at least once today, we'll be doing breakout rooms for you to share some ideas and uh, think about a garden that you're familiar with. And there'll be also opportunities to do some chats um, and give feedback to each other on, on the garden. I want to start in a little bit with telling about why it's important, why I think working in gardens, school gardens is important for the food farm to institution movement, farm to school movement. Uh, I'll take some time to talk about our work at the Midwest Food Connection and some of the projects we've been doing in the gardens we work with. But then most of all, I want to think about our gardens um, and how we can set them up for success for learning for large groups. How, what, we can do for space, what we can do for planting, different uh, plants, flowers, foods that we can grow, and finally activities that we can lead with children. Okay, let's do the next slide. So I'd love to know who's in the room. I'm really welcome all of you here this morning. So there's gonna we're gonna put up a little a little poll with these three options. And if you are able to classify yourself in one of them, please take a second to do so and we'll see who's in the room with us. So 
I don't see that now. Nick, is, uh, is Nicole, is the poll going up? Great. Yep. I, I, I don't I don't see that. You see the results there? No, I guess I don't have that on my screen. I can share those. So it looks like um, educators make up 57% of the group, grower, gardeners, 7%, and then allies, 36%. Great. Okay, excellent. Glad to have so many educators here and allies, and the grower gardeners can fit right in. Very nice. All right, let's do the next slide. So I'm going to, I, I, I imagine there's no, is there snow there, Nicole, where you are? What's the weather like? No, it's going to be, I think, 60 degrees today. Okay. <laughs> are, 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 do you put seeds in the ground yet in Southern Ohio this time of year? Uh, not yet, but soon. Yeah. All right, well, we're going to, I want to, this is a, a one minute little movie about one of the gardens I work with and, or minute and a half, and I, I want to see it so I can get in the mood of um, of things growing and things being green. Um, so you can just do some Zen and watch this if you like, or if you'd like to try to count the food plants that you see, that would be exciting too. I'm, I think I'm just going to be quiet and we'll just kind of Zen out and meditate and watch this garden. So um, Nikki, you can go ahead and play the movie. Getting towards the end here. There's about 12 beds. Getting towards the end. What? Can you recognize that there? Great, thanks for playing that. I love seeing that goldenrod at the end that came out of nowhere in our garden there. So as you noticed, okay, someone said they didn't see the video. Did other people see the video? Did you see it, Nicole? Yeah, okay. All right, let's see most people saw it. So as you noticed, that was not a product. This is not a production garden. This is a garden in South Minneapolis at a school called Northrop School. This is a learning garden and my team, volunteers and teachers, really worked on getting a large diversity there. You perhaps saw the artichoke at the very, very beginning of the, um, at the very, the, one of the first shots was an artichoke. There were some ground cherries in there, it kind of zoomed in on ground cherries wrapped in their little um, paper wrap. Um, a nice little bit of lavender. If anybody wants to, if anybody was counting and you want to put a number of food plants you saw in there, but maybe also just relax and just watch it go. Thanks. So that puts us in the right frame of mind. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. I saw someone teach 25. I see a question in the chat about summer school. This was actually uh, September, October, but we can talk about summer school too. So why do you, do we, why does my organization focus on teaching in schoolyard gardens? I list some factors here. You know, the, the, the pie for 
farm to school, farm to institution has three components, right? It has procurement, it has education, and it has schoolyard gardens. At least that's the way we place in Minnesota. I think the national model is that too. So I hear, and it's, I think it's a great conversation. I think about 80% of the conversation I hear about farm to school is procurement, which is good. And I, a lot of that is, um, a lot of that is at this conference too, and I look forward to learning about it as I attend other sessions. But I think education is not to be um, not to be left out of that. If students are not see seeing, being introduced in friendly ways, interesting ways to the food that is brought to them, they may or may not choose to eat it. You all, many of you, have been into lunchrooms, and um, you see that children eat what they want to eat. They're mostly there for socializing, not eating, which is fine. They need to socialize. Um, but a lot of the food gets does not get eaten. And if it's something new or unavailable, they may not eat it too. Now, some there are lunchrooms that work on education. I think that's that's laudable. I think one should do that if one has the time and energy. But the lunchroom is not the best place for teaching. The best place for teaching is in the classroom. And I've been involved or some in some efforts to break down the break down the walls between the lunchroom and the classroom that is to say that the people bringing the food into the classroom are more familiar with sorry the people bringing food into the lunchroom are more familiar with what's happening in the classroom and that the classroom teachers might have some sense of what's happening in the lunchroom but it's very hard to do that we're very school school workers are very focused on their job they have plenty to do as it is um so so the connections between lunchroom or classroom are really very, very slim in my experience, but I'm happy to learn from you if you have, have had better success with that. But we're working on it. Um, our, at some of my schools, the lunchroom, people do come out and, and look at what we're growing, and sometimes they have some of it, pick some of it and use it in the, um, and use it in the garden and use it in the lunchroom. Um, but we need to do more of that. And so the schoolyard garden as so procurement, education, schoolyard garden as a third option, as a third piece of the pie. Schoolyard gardens are the obvious way to make the connection between food and learning, either through production for the lunchroom or as I will be presenting more today in connecting children and connecting uh, children with being in the in the garden to learn about it. All right, let's go to the next slide. This is the mission statement of my organization. Food connects us with each other, our planet and ourselves. Midwest Food Connection inspires young people to deepen their relationship with food, benefiting their bodies, their communities, and the earth. Nikki, why don't you actually pull the um, slideshow down for a while and I'll just talk a little bit. So I can I can be the center of the screen. I'll be in there. Thank you. Um, so we were founded in the early 90s. I will just give a, a brief brief snapshot of this. Early 90s, uh, we actually growing, grew out of the natural uh, co-op, the food co-op movement here. It's very strong in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul. At, at the time, we might have had seven or eight different co-ops right in the city limits and more in the surrounding areas. And a couple of co-op leaders decided they wanted to do an outreach, start an outreach program for elementary children, K through five, K through six. So we, um, I was hired at that time and I've kind of stuck with it. I've done different things along the way, but more or less stuck with it. And I was able to form a nonprofit then at one point in the 90s, in the early 2000s, started growing a staff so we've had different amounts three or four sometimes even five people on staff teaching and our focus has always been to bring the whole picture of food into classrooms so the model we've we've adopted right away was one where teachers classroom teachers invite us in so if you teach second grade and you would like a lesson on on the garden or on fall harvest a lot of our work has been in the classroom not not in the garden. So we started doing right in the classroom, we'll be there for an hour and teach about wheat, teach about vegetables, 
And we're always combining, I think of us combining biology and growing as one side, then culture and history on the other, and then tasting and health or, or your body on the third. So because of those three stools. So everything is always in context. There's never food just picked out as right often the case. Often we're present children are presented food and they're just given something. Here's something green, here's something red, here's the name of it, try it. Um, currently we're very excited about it. Finally, we've gotten done this after many, many years. We're finally doing a unit on our for the tastes that our tongue notices. So we're still masked up here in Minnesota in the schools. So I get to have the kids take their masks off and stick out their tongues. And we do a lesson on sweet, a lesson on sour, bitter, and umami. <clears throat> Salty we leave out. So those are the five tastes that your tongue, the primary tastes that your tongue notices. And the bitter has been very fun. The bitter is, is it's challenging because it's not a taste that kids, um, a, a taste that kids like necessarily. But we've already done sour. We've done um, sweet. So the kids, we've trained the kids to use their tongues to appreciate food. So with bitter, we bring in a variety of foods. We start with the bitter melon, which is a, a amazing Asian. It actually we learned it it um, originated maybe first in Africa, but it, it's an Asian cooking food. Maybe some of you have had it. And it's not eaten raw. It's put into soups and stews. But we have the kids eat it raw, and it's just very, very bitter. If you need to know what bitter is, taste that. And then we have different things, cranberry, broccoli. And then we end up with bitter chocolate. But which, of course, is lovely. And they all want their chocolate, even though it's 75% or 72% cocoa. But along the way, I can... We can teach them about cocoa, about the native origins of cocoa in Central and South America, about the very odd way that the cocoa bean grows on the tree and the beans are harvested from that big pod that hangs off the cocoa tree. Um, so they're, by the time they have them getting their little piece of chocolate, they've been tasting other bitter foods, but they've also learned about what, what this chocolate is. They've seen pictures of it and we and then I have them make a scale like from least to most. What and then, then they, they write in the foods. Like the bitter melon is the most, it's at the top, and then the broccoli might be more towards the bottom, and then chocolate kind of comes in somewhere in the middle towards the bottom. So they're ranking, they're using their own tongue to decide what's happening, and then they rank that. So just to give you a sense of how we how we come into the classroom and give children lots of experiences, different experiences. Let's go back to the slideshow then, please, Nikki. So here's, we're going to move up. So um, I'm going to show you, there, I think they're moving up the slideshow. You can move up again. We've seen that. So yeah, hold that for a minute. So that was our life for a while. I think you, I don't know how many of you saw that. That's, I think, children, they may actually be tasting sour at the time, I'm trying to remember. So that was our life for a while. Um, but the year before that, go to the next screen, please. This is before, so right in the spring of 2020, school shut down. So in that year, we still were able to work with this many students in eight different school districts at 44 schools. And we're looking to get back close to that this year and definitely next year. All right, next slide, please. So I want to mention something that the state of Minnesota hired Midwest Food Connection for in the last um, nine months. The state of Minnesota, the Farm to School program from the Department of Agriculture decided to launch a statewide food of the month or uh, harvest of the month uh, pilot. And they chose, I think they have 12 school districts around the state chosen for that volunteer to do this pilot. And so starting in September, every food, every month had a has a harvest of the month. And I, you know, one maybe September was apple and October and maybe it was wild rice, which is big, big local food here. So to order to getting back to the lunchroom classroom divide, in order to break that divide, 
the, the Department of Ag reached out to us asking if we could develop lessons and activities to go along with each with foods. If we've done six of them so far, we did three in the fall and three for, for also for the spring. And so we went, went to set about making a teacher friendly set of lessons and activities. And what was interesting about that is that actually we decided what really would be friendly would be short five or 10 minute activities for students to do. So just as an example, cutting a squash open, counting the seeds of a squash, something where the teacher can pull it off of that takes little work because they'd have to have some supplies um, or a quick worksheet that showed the background of where wild rice grows, where the beds are in Minnesota and how that's associated with the native tribes that are, are, are important to us here. And we've we've heard that that especially we've also we also developed full hour long le lessons one for each food, but we've heard that the little activities have been very successful and teachers have been liking that been able to pull that out, and we're looking forward to hearing more of a full full um, evaluation of how that worked. But we're also excited to do more, and we're we're happy that that can happen that that so teachers can have a quick way of say okay this whole month of October whatever, perhaps apples, we're highlighting apples, or highlighting squash, let's say squash. So let's once a week, we'll pull something in. And then when kids see the squash in the in the lunchroom, they'll have more of a sense what's going on and they'll be able to connect the dots and hopefully enjoy the food more. Great. So let's go ahead and talk about our gardens. Um, any, we, we can just quick stop, maybe Nicole, if anybody has questions, comments about, about the work that I've been describing here in Minnesota. If not, we can go to the, our gardens. I'm kind of seeing. <clears throat> Should I answer that, Nicole, in the chat? Yeah, you can go ahead and answer that. If you yeah. Have. So do you want me to read the question? Uh, I can read it. So okay. The question is, is this a public school? Do you have to get permission slips from the parents for the kids to be allowed to eat the vegetables? At our private school garden in Texas, we didn't, but my public school colleague did. That's interesting. No, we didn't. So I, we work primarily at public schools. Those 44 schools you had listed, there maybe were three or four that were parochial or private. Um, so no, we don't ever have to do that, uh, permission slips. We only, if the food... We don't pre we don't bring any prepared food from home in, of course. So we prepare food in the classroom. Say we'll cook up pasta or cook up vegetables. So the Minnesota state law says if it's anything that's prepared in the classroom, it's fine to eat. So I, I couldn't bring I couldn't bring um, you know a casserole in for home, a wild rice casserole, and have kids taste that. So I've never and also for tasting in the garden, no, we didn't never had to do permissions. So um, sorry to hear that. That sounds harder in in uh, Texas. Yeah. Great. Well, let's go to the next slide. <laughs> Thanks for asking that, Annie. Here I am with um, some first or second graders. See, I have lots of some vegetables spread out there. Um, we may be thinking about parts of the plant and if we eat roots or greens. You see the garden in the background. So of those 40, I should have said, of those 44 schools, there's about four or five where we work in the garden. So those are schools where we're more intensely involved in and come April in Minnesota, April, May, and then September, October, we're pretty busy outside. And then the rest of the year we're inside and uh, also also in those spring months in, inside some. I wanna first talk about space. So if we, let's go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so not every garden is going to be a work for large groups of kids. Here's a nice garden where you can see variety of things growing. There's a path down there, uh, uh, right? A uh, uh, wood chip path for kids to spread out on. So certainly large is nice, but large is not always very possible. Let's do the next slide. So if you can't do large, I like to have make sure there's variety and then there's different spaces. This is a, a garden at a school that actually doesn't exist anymore. Um, the irony is that they tore, they put
put in a, a school kitchen right right here where these children are. There's a school kitchen now. But parents got involved and excited, and they started a new garden on the other side of the school, which is doing really well as well as also. But this garden was super fun because there was behind the photographer, there, there are some plum trees where kids could um, climb up even though they weren't supposed to, or they could hide behind it. It was a little private space there. Um, there's a variety of beds that were very accessible to kids and different things growing as, as the people have planted it, different things growing everywhere. Big morning glory on that, on that fence. You see kids here doing some recording drawing. We can talk about, we'll talk about activities a little later. Let's do the next photo. This is not a garden of mine. This is in a warm place. <laughs> Interesting, something to think about. The garden is accessible. You see how it's spread out so people can be in different places. Not a lot growing there, um, but maybe it's the beginning of a season. But I like the idea, I like, I pulled this off another presentation because I like the way the planters are set up and it's inviting and accessible. And it's also in a space where the kids can get right to it. So maybe it's even the play space that, that they're at. I'd, I've worked with one school where parent, there were a group of parents and they were very, very, they led the whole gardening adventure for about 10 years, as long as their kids were at that school. And they put the garden in next to the hard top of the playground where kids play kickball and soccer. And it was a, a great Southern exposure for now we have to chop down some trees or tree limbs, but it was a great Southern exposure at the time. But the ball kept falling in and there wasn't a clear delineation. So you couldn't really teach. It's hard to teach during recess time because the kids were there making noise right next to it. So it was accessible. They, we did put a, wall, a kind of a, a, a low wall in. So I would say the garden was successful, but it was a challenge having it be right next to the playground area. One nice thing about that garden though, is it was stretched similar to the one I've shown you earlier today where the movie was, it was stretched long garden. So one could easily spread out the 25 kids in groups of six in order to be in different places in the garden where they can move around and not have not be with in a clump all the time. Let's go to the next slide. So here you have this is odd. This is a student who does not have mine, who has kind of has my name. My name is Uli spelled U L I, and this student is spelled U L E E. And this Here's an activity we do on occasion with kids every spring, which we can have them draw a dream garden. And so this child named Uli has a path growing through a garden. You can see there the different things they have growing. There's some tree, uh, fruit trees right in the middle. Then the lower, there's some mint growing. There's wildflowers. So Uli really went out of their way to have a variety of things growing. And in Uli's dream, there are, it's also very accessible. There's a, easy to get to the different places, see different things. If you're in the, if you're working with the strawberries, you're in a different spot from the snap peas or from the peach tree, which that wouldn't that be lovely, have a peach tree in your garden. So I thought let's have a, let's do a, some contribution in the chat. If everybody would please think, if you think about what plants, given that you want to teach kids in the garden, given that you want to provide a variety of experiences in the garden, what are some plants, food plants or other plants that you would put in? If everybody would please write one or two in the chat and we'll see what, what, we, what we come up with. We'll see them come up here. <laughs> Great, I love the sweet potatoes. potatoes. <laughs> Asparagus would be fun. There's a, there's a perennial. I love the idea of perennials. Yep, I love the sniffing idea. Getting tomatoes in. Yes, yeah, sunflowers. Kids love sunflowers. We'll just give it another minute or so here. So people are 
choosing things that are accessible, easy to pick. It's great if cabbages or pumpkins can be can 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 really have a have a fun harvest time with those. I tried. We put loofah seeds in. They didn't come up, but we tried loofah seeds. If I if I if I understand what Toby is saying, I think loofah is a plant that makes to make kind of a plastic. A, 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 it's not for eating, right? It's for 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 crafts or doing things with. If Toby, if you want to write more about that, we, we can read it in the chat. <laughs> Great, we can have keep having that come in. Thanks for sharing. I'm going to show you one list. I'm going to go to the next slide, please. <laughs> That's right. Thanks, Andy, for clarifying. So Andy and Claire is that loofah makes a sponge, which I'd, I'd love to be growing that. I really should look for plants. Here's a, a list that I've kind of thrown out there. Some of that you've, some of these you've mentioned. I put fall raspberries in because, okay, thanks, Molly. Molly writes, you can also eat loofah before it matures. Nice. Thank you. I've thrown some um, less, less well-known foods on here. Mustard greens are love, excellent for tasting in the garden, small amounts. Rainbow chard adds color. Let's go to the next slide. This is a snake gourd. If you've never drawn snake, had snake gourds, I really recommend them. I had the, I actually grew them back as an experiment in my garden, they are just lovely. Show the next slide here just for fun. <laughs> There's me with all my snake gourds. And of course, kids then, as, I, as, you, as you saw in the last photo, um, kids can color them or that. So I, I've, I, have to, I have to do that again, grow those snake gourds. All right, let's go to the next photo. I have at one of my schools, chocolate mint is the I don't know. I think this might be chocolate mint. Might be, might be um, a spearmint. Try spearmint. I have one school where chocolate mint is the is the um, the iconic food that grows there, and it's grown there for 15, 20 years. Construction has been done. Everything's been pulled out of the garden, um, but the mint has always come back, and it's one the one food where I can. I, I can say tell kids anytime you want to have some, just come over and have some chocolate mint. You don't want to say that with tomatoes because they'll be gone. Um, they won't be there for the classroom lessons. But mint is it's fun to have it come back. And of course, chives also come back. Those perennials really add a lot to the garden. Next slide. Just a couple other. Those those little peppers, mustard greens. So the out of the box foods that one wouldn't think about regularly, like that like that loofah. And the next slide. So I know this is hard to see. <clears throat> That's okay. We're um, I'm going to actually show you in a in the chat a link to a document where I'm going to ask you just for fun to take five or seven minutes and to and to fill out what I call a scavenger hunt in the garden, where one can smell things, draw things, pick little things identify foods. Um, I'm trying to think, I think what I'll do is, could we see the next slide, please? <clears throat> so here, right, so here's springtime and students are on a scavenger hunt. They're looking for things, they're looking for taste things. I, if there's one thing I love in a garden is kids running around finding stuff. Because it's, of, of course, usually one wants them settled and organized in groups and have focused attention, but sometimes to let them roam is just so much fun. So I'm going to put, let's see, Nikki, do you want to put that link in the chat again? So I have a, a link to a, a Google form, and we're going to do breakout sessions. It looks like there's about 20, 25 people here. Um, I'm going to ask you with a partner to go to fill out a, a scavenger hunt. So there's gonna be blanks <clears throat> in this document. And you can either work with a real garden you have, talk to your partner, please fill it out together. Think about a real part garden you have or 
a garden you'd like to have? And what would you like to have kids looking at, looking for smelling? So the way we're going to do this is that you're going to get assigned to a group, randomly assigned. You'll be group number one or group number five or group number 10. Please take that number in the in the Google document. So there's pages. I think there's 20 pages. So you'll you'll only need your number. So you go to number five and you fill that out. If you want to look around to see what other groups are doing, you can. But but focus for the next five minutes on that one on that one document. Nicole, does that sound clear? Yep, that sounds good. So okay. um, we'll send everybody to breakout rooms and then meet back here in about five to seven minutes. Right. So everybody see that the last that go, go to the Google Doc link and then and then I'll see you in the breakout room or you'll see each other. We're going to go through a couple more slides and then take some questions. I just want to highlight some other activities for the garden. So we'll go through that a little bigger clip. We can do the next slide, please. Recording. We talked about that drawing recording lessons. Next slide. Here's a list of other ideas. I love the garden prep work either for fall, putting gardens to bed or for spring, applying mulch, sowing winter cover crops in the fall or in the spring, turning them over. Next photo. Here's kids weeding. Um, some beds that were not controlled, having great fun, just pulling out plants by the roots, stacking up a compost pile. Next slide. And we had a here's gardens in our October put to bed. We had a after the school, we had an after after school work session where parents showed up with and kids as well. And we except for a few perennials, we put everything under for the winter. Next slide. And then of course it's great to have food prep. Make salads in the garden, put herbs on crackers to to sample them or taking food into the classroom, doing harvesting, as I've done on occasion when it's rainy or too cold, doing some quick harvesting, then bringing it inside. And then the students can work inside on their with their with their cooking or foods. Next slide. Here's um, a colleague of mine on the left. Her, their name is Katya, and they're making pesto with wild um, with it's kind of more we with with other food with un, unscheduled foods what, what one might call weeds in the garden next slide salad kids made freshly picked cut up little plastic knives little plates and they could they have them sit in the garden and do that next slide this is a herbal pizza where i bring the uh, like one of these um portable pizza ovens out into the into the garden with an extension cord, and then kids are placing fresh herbs on it. Makes for a great, great fun snack outside. And next slide. So I like to think about what some of your next steps might be. So we'll pull up the one more slide, but while you consider these questions, well, I'll take questions from you. But but I'd love you to consider what as you go into the spring. What could be some of your next steps as gardeners or as educators? How about what you want to plant in the garden? You have a one or two new ideas to put in the garden for fun. How can you get more kids out there? How can you get more buy-in from teachers or school classes to get kids into the garden? Or what advocacy can you do? The school district to support more food for the garden or money for the garden or connections between the lunchroom and the, and the garden. So I'd love all of you to Consider that to take some next steps, even then here, March is the perfect time to do this. And then we'll look, um, well, I'll take a couple of minutes if some folks have questions for me. I also want to honor a, a, a woman in the audience, uh, Molly Sowash is with us today, and she worked for Midwest Food Connection for three, four years. Um, so if you know her or want to ask her a question or talk to her, that's a great resource um, for you as well. Thanks, Molly, for coming. All right, Nicole, any questions in the garden from, from you? All right. Well, thanks so much, Uli. Uh, a lot of those activities look so much look like so much fun for kids. I feel like that would be even good for college students or even adults to do, um, just to be able to recognize fruits and vegetables. So that was really great. Uh, but now we have, looks like about eight minutes. We're going to open up um, some Q&A. So if you would like to put your questions in the chat, I will help field those for Uli. And we'll go ahead and open it up here. 
Um, I'll go ahead and start while we have some questions populated in the chat. Oh. Lee. I was wondering, um, for the schools that don't have an established garden yet, do you bring them to your garden? Um, and I was just wondering how you um, deal with any transportation issues or as a barrier mm -hmm. to getting kids, bringing kids to the garden. Yeah, right. Thank you. So we don't bring kids to our gardens, but we do have we've done field trips, both urban to urban gardens and urban farms and to uh, nearby rural farms. And the busing definitely is a challenge. The the buses aren't a challenge. Well, the money has been a challenge. So when we can, we have set money aside or get some grant funding for, for schools to go. Actually, the last year now, bus drivers have been a challenge too, maybe where you are, but where we are, there's you've not even been enough bus drivers. So, um, and certainly COVID put a damper on that. So we haven't done a trip in a couple of years, I think, but we are getting geared up to do some in the spring. And there's some urban gardens that really, um, actually our school district even has a garden where that, that they're inviting classes to come. We hope to bring some there. Oh. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. All right, I see some questions coming in. Are you commissioned or paid by local or state and do you or do you fund yourself? So we're a nonprofit that we have to fund ourselves, although we have um, the natural food co-ops that started the started our organization. Of uh, three of them give strong funding to us on a yearly basis. And so that that is about a half of our funding and then I get some schools have to pay I ask schools to pay uh, sometimes and um, we also do get foundation support great I see another person typing in the chat mm -hmm. great while she's typing do you hold any annual fundraisers we we do we have we have we've, we actually had a really fun guard fundraiser in a garden last summer in August um, outside and at, at folks come and then we have we're going to have one in the spring in a couple months great. as well so it's great that we have donors around the country. All right, of all the fun school garden activities you mentioned, is there one top favorite for the kids that would say? that you would say everyone shouldn't forget to do. Uh, that's nice. Well, the I hope most of you got past that URL to do some scavenger hunts. I that's very top of my list because I the kids are focused in their in their work and they're also doing many different things and able to roam on their own. Um but I also love that when I we have a little little um tablecloths and break the kids into groups of four or five and assign them to harvest certain foods. And then bring them back to their tablecloths and cut up little salads. I showed you a photo of that. I think that's a really top top activity to do that. I love doing that. So the kids are active. They're picking their own food. They're cutting it. They have lots of questions about what and where and what. Um, great exploration. Yeah, that salad looked so good and so fresh. All right, David asks, what is a good student teacher ratio? Yes, so. Ideal for me when I come in, so if there's a class of 25 and I'm the guest teacher and of course there's a classroom teacher, if we can have one more person. So I would say in a, in a, in a class of, you know, kids that are, you know, where most kids are well behaved and some are a little more challenging, um, I think one to eight works or one to six. So I think one, one to 10 or one to 12 is more challenging. Do you have any yeah, parent that's... volunteers? Every now and then we have a we do have volunteers that come in, um, but um, not less parent volunteers. There's sometimes there's an assistant in the school, or we have a volunteer on our end that we bring in. But I, you know, maybe I should work on that harder, getting some parent volunteers because when they they're very excited about the work we do. All right. Any other questions? Well, I, well, thanks, Nicole, for having me. I was really excited to be able to present and meet some of the folks that, that are, well, kind of meet you at the conference. I'll show up at some other, other events and maybe see you again. Um, I hope you really take with you that the positive experiences around food are so important for children. 
that the, that as we get great food into the lunchrooms and into the schools, we want children to have those positive experiences. And those have to be planned. They don't come out of nowhere. So even the way you plan a garden, the way you set up things in the garden is going to create those experiences for children. So thanks again. I hope everybody has a great day. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Uli, for sharing um, your work with us. It sounds like you're doing wonderful work and it was really great to learn about it. Um, and thank you for all of the attendees for coming to our session today. And as a reminder, in the theme of educating future generations, our next session is up at 10 a.m. and we'll be on school gardens and classroom and cafeteria education in rural elementary and secondary schools. And you can find the link for that session on the Farm to Institution Summit website. And thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your day.